<laughs> okay, I hope you're all set up with snacks and drinks and um, we can start. Good evening and welcome to our third and concluding panel discussion of the series Feminisms in Times of Recording War. Recording in progress. <laughs> uh, my name is Radwa Khaled Ibrahim. I'm part of the Political Communication Department at Medico International and responsible there for transformative aid and emergency relief. This series is a cooperation between Medico International and the Focal Point Global South um, of the Institute of Political Science at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. My cooperation partner, Professor Otto Ruppert, cannot welcome you today personally as um, due to illness, unfortunately. When we thought uh, about the series, we wanted to make sense of the feminist silence and fragility of consensus of the peace-oriented focus of international feminist theory and practice. Feminist concepts of peace as a societal-wide process were often more radical of those of other current, uh, leftist currents. However, especially with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it has become evident how fragile such a basic consensus within feminist movements has become. The connection between feminism and anti-violence policies, arms and weapon critique and anti-militarism is fundamentally being questioned today. We wanted to ask, with this series, what holds true as an emancipatory perspective in war during these times of geopolitical upheavals around the world and within which feminist contexts? What answers do the major questions of conflict transformation and peace politics do feminist analysis and grassroots policies currently offer? Where do the particular potentials of feminist intersectional approaches lie for transformation of the world? In the first panel discussion about feminist foreign policy in times of war, we followed how much and what type of feminism is actually embedded in the theory and practical implementation of the German feminist international politics. What contribution it makes to the discussion or discourses about the contemporary wars and what relationship it has with the process of militarization in Germany and Europe. The second panel discussion about the war in Gaza focused on the question how we can formulate a peace approach from a feminist perspective that can guarantee everyone a life in dignity. Which means what contribution feminist perspectives make to the understanding of the current relations of violence, which analytical, sociopolitical and cultural political differentiations are in are in the foreground the experiences of the feminist practice and these perspectives that can be built on them and of course the demands that can be derived from them. We conclude with Sudan. When we speak about Sudan we speak about a response from the periphery to the violence of, glo of global capitalism and its gendered and rationalized and racialized foundations as the revolution formulated a possibility for other global relations. Women's and feminist politics in Sudan hold a central position in overall societal and political developments. They constitute the core position um, in overall societal and political development. Uh, sorry, they constitute the core of diverse self-organization processes that sustain civilian life in Sudan. At the same time, the war that re-erupted in spring 2023 is also being waged on Flinta bodies. A war that has been coined the greatest forgotten war of our times. According to the latest UN estimations, more than 25 million people need urgently humanitarian aid. Sudan is also the story of geopolitical power contestations of humanitarian failure in times of so-called feminist international relations. A manifestation on global scale 
that black lives matter and only some are saved. What can, fe what can feminist peace policies learn from Sudan? What insights do the revolutionary processes in Sudan offer for feminist transformation processes? We will speak about that and more with our guests today. And we are very lucky to have such a high calibre panel today uh, who can teach us a lot about the practices, but also the analysis of the current situation and how to read it and to challenge it from a feminist perspective. It is therefore not a coincidence to conclude with Sudan. Rather, Sudan offers already an outlook for how to think a future in dignity. This evening is moderated by Antonia Vangelista. Antonia is a freelance journalist for Radio and Print. She's especially interested in South-North relations and issues of social and economic justice. Together with her colleague, Lisa Westheiser, she received a grant from JournalistInnenbund the past year, with which they researched on and reported about the multiple roles of Sudanese women in peace work and conflict. Before giving over to Antonia, um, I want to thank everyone uh, from both institutions um, in the backstage of that series, without whom it would have not seen the light. Denise Sima, Lukas Schmidt, Andrea Schult, Vivian Kaplan, Miriam Tschkutschenke, Ischel Ilderen, and Anne Nathanael Reuschel. So, this event is recorded, uh, so if you wish not to appear, please inform Lucas. Lucas, please raise your hand. Thank you. And um, if you wish to learn more and know more about the work of Medical International and receive our quarter yearly um, publication and newsletter, you can um, write your name and register outside. Thank you. And I give over to Antonia and welcome again. Good evening. We have already heard in Sudan there is the greatest forgotten war that is fought right now and also in Germany we do not hear much about this place. Um, there is a war fought between two military leaders since past April but this is not only a war between two men but it is also a war against all the feminist and revolutionary movements that have been formed in the past years. There have been great transformation in Sudan, especially in the past five years, and those were mainly also built up and strengthened by the Sudanese women. There are many lessons to learn for feminist movements elsewhere, and that is what we will speak about today. A special welcome to our three panel members, Sarah Abbas, Samah Khalafala, and my son Elni Jumi. Sarah Ab Abbas is a political scientist, researcher, and feminist, and she works from Germany and is active in diasporic solidarity activism with the Sudanese Revolution. After the outbreak of the war, she helped establishing a unit at the UK-based diaspora organization Shabaka. This unit supports the Sudanese civil society and grassroots mutual aid initiatives in the humanitarian response to the war. She's also writing on Sudan from a feminist perspective. Then, Sama Khalafala. Uh, is a Sudanese human rights advocate and feminist with a focus on sexual and reproductive health rights. She has a bachelor in community health management and a master in gender development and peace, both from Afad University for Women in Om Omdurman, Sudan. Currently, she's a doctoral researcher at the African Multiple Cluster of Excellence at the University of Bayreuth in Germany and her PhD thesis focuses on queer subjects in Sudan. Welcome. 
And my soon Ali Jumi actually joins us from Sydney. So a special appreciation because in Sydney it's 5 a.m. in the morning right now. So my soon is a writer and blogger residing in Sydney and an advocate of direct direct democracy, popular sovereignty and grassroots organization on the basis of feminizing political space and structure. Before I give the word to the three speakers, let me briefly recapture the events that happened in the past years in Sudan. So since December 2018, many people went on the streets to demand a change in the politics and to to protest against President Omar al-Bashir, who had been a dictator for almost 30 years. They finally succeeded in April 2019. The president stepped down. And in this revolution, there were so many women involved. So the majority of women who went on the streets, they were women. They organized themselves. They, they demanded, they, they collected the demands for a new vision of Sudan. They, they talked about the sexual violence that they faced and they were very active in organizing for another politics. However, the military, after the stepping down of the president, claimed the power, so the protest continues. There was a protest camp in front of the military headquarters in Khartoum, which was very violently dissolved. Many people were killed. Um, and only after the invention of the African Union, there was a transitional government that was installed in August 2019 with both civilian forces and military forces. However, some of the people who had gone to the streets, they did not quite feel represented in this transitional government and especially they remained suspicious of the military which still had their fingers in the, in the politics. And their suspicion proved right because the military did another military coup in September and October 2021 where they arrested several uh, civil, civil politicians, among them the prime minister. And finally, from the beginning of 2021, the leader of the army, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, became the de facto ruler of Sudan. He collaborated very closely with Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, who is better known as Hamati, and who is the leader of the par paramilitary unit of the Rapid Support Forces. They worked very closely together until in April of last year, they started fighting, fighting each other with the war that started in Khartoum and spread over the country. By now, almost 8 million people are displaced but even in these times of war, women continue to organize themselves. They continue to fight for other feminist visions of Sudan. And that is what we will hear about today. So I would now like to hand over. There will be a short input of each of the speaker. Then we will have a panel discussion and we will afterwards open the, the discussion to questions from you. So I would first like to give the word to my soon Ali Jumi. Um, hello, uh, thank you um, for having me here today. Thank you, Antonia. Thank you, um, Radua and Medico International. Um, it is uh, morning, as you said here, and I'm, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to join you. Um, I have to say that I'm speaking, um, I'm, I'm currently on uh, the land that belongs to the indigenous people of the Darug people. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. This is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, and I stand in solidarity with the struggle of the Aboriginal people uh, um, in their um, you know, struggle against the uh, uh, colonizing institutions of the state. Um, I stand in solidarity because they were the first to show solidarity um, um, with the Sudanese revolution in 2018. And I think it's very important that I mention that. Um, it's very hard to, you know, for us during this time, and I'm sure it is for my colleagues to speak about what's happening in Sudan because we're still talking about an open wound. Uh, we're talking about our families who are there, but it's always healing. Um, when you speak in a space of sisterhood, 
um, it's kind of you know there's a bit of healing uh, of the wounds. Um, you know, Antonia, you you, you gave a, a a very comprehensive you know introduction, and I just said like, oh, there goes my introduction. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so yeah, the war started in um, the 15th of April, 2023, um, in the end of uh, Ramadan, and which holds a lot of you know traumatic memories because the dispersal of the um, of the of the sit-in uh, in 2019 also happened towards the end of the Ramadan, and the great violence that was um, you know faced the revolutionaries faced in the sit-in is just brought up all of these memories. Um, and so, yeah, the, it, the war happened amidst, amidst the political escalation between the Sudanese armed forces, or the leader of the Sudanese armed forces, the SAF, and the head of the rapid support forces, uh, Hemeti, or the RSF. Um, it's estimated that more than 15,000 have been killed, um, 10, 10 million displaced, the highest number of displacement um, in the world, um, uh, 18 million facing acute hunger right now, uh, five million experiencing, you know, emergency levels of hunger. Um, and um, regarding, um, you know, sexual violence against women um, and rape, um, it, there is no, you know, um, you know, accurate estimate because reporting of uh, sexual violence is, um, you know, is, is still very difficult, but the, um, you know, the combating violence, uh, uh, Against Women Unit, which is a governmental body, has reported, you know, over um, over 88, you know, documented, um, uh, you know, cases. Um, we know that that's that the number is far more than that, um, and it's from both parties. Uh, it's believed it's from the RSF for a great degree, and also uh, the armed forces. Um, since the first day of the war. Um, the um, resistance committees through the emergency rooms um, formed, um, you know, so they created those emergency rooms, rooms which, you know, perform different duties, uh, which is informing people around the world. This is a role, this is a gap that has not been filled by anybody, neither the government, neither the, you know, the political elite, uh, of course, and neither the RSF. Uh, there was no information about what was happening. This role was, you know, taken on uh, by the resistance committees and the um, resistant neighborhoods, which we'll come to explain later what they are. Um, information about safe routes for evacuation. Um, they actually started forming evacuating teams. And, uh, you know, we saw during the first days that even embassies like the, you know, the UK embassy and the US embassy asking for help from the emergency, you know, uh, uh, from the resistance committees to help them evacuate their own, um, you know, their own, uh, their own people. And also the repurposing of medical centers. So, uh, you know, medical centers have been repurposed to provide, uh, you, know, uh, you know, emergency and medical help uh, for people. And then as the war continued, uh, you know, through the months, their role has expanded now to creating the neighborhood kitchens. Uh, which uh, you know either prepare uh, ready-made uh, food for people in the neighborhoods, or um, you know disseminate like uh, distribute uh, uh, basic uh, necessities for the people. And uh, so you see this immediate, uh, um, and, and I think this is the only like the in this bleak situation. This is like the only like ray or uh, of light is this very quick you know organizing that happened in a very you know in emergent situation. Um, and and uh, this model that has uh, you know formed across Sudan, like the, the emergency room uh, model has formed across Sudan, which shows this high level of organizing um, um, you know, on the ground from the neighborhood committees. And uh, yeah, I just <laughs> I'll end here and leave the opportunity for my colleagues to speak. Hello. Okay. Um, thank you, Antonia, for the introduction. Um, okay, so there is uh, an African uh, proverb saying that until the lion tells his side of the story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. This is the reason why I'm here. I'm here to share my story uh, with you and uh, since Sudan war has gone um, invisible, I believe it's our responsibility 
to tell what's happening on the ground. Uh, before coming here, I was thinking, where should I start? Uh, should I start with the revolution or the war? And I found, I found myself swinging between so overwhelming feelings of the critical hope that we felt during the revolution and the disappointment feelings we have right now. Um, so going back in time, I think without revol the revolution, I wouldn't have been here with you today. Uh, I participated in the revolution. I was there in the streets demanding for peace, justice, and freedom. Um, and I was surrounded by my feminist friends and queer friends. Um, the revolution for me started on the day that I stood in front of my father saying that, no, I want to, to pursue my education. I want to do my master's. Um, I come from a very small village uh, far in the north of Sudan, where education for girls and women is almost doesn't exist. So my family had to to flee to the center, Khartoum, which is a capital, uh, to secure better education opportunities for me and my, my sister. Um, without the revolution, um, I couldn't even have thought that I would do my PhD, <laughs> neither <laughs> be uh, a PhD on queer subjects. <laughs> so the revolution was was a start point for me, was the turning point in my life, where it reflects even on my personal uh, life. Uh, it gave me the strength of knowing what I want to do on a personal level and on a collective level. Um, so yes, <laughs> I found I landed on an opportunity and I packed my bags I came to Germany looking for um, using the tools of the master. Um, as soon as I arrived in Germany, the coup took place. And, hmm, and after the coup, I went back home for my field work. And immediately I felt like I landed on a very strange land. This is not. Uh, the thing I left behind. Um, there were some ugly developments post the coup period. Um, anyhow, uh, what I just wanted to say, uh, we embodied the revolution, we believed in it. Uh, and seeing that the de-escalation that happened after the revolution, although it was quite fast, but we did not expect the war. We did not expect um, the horror of the war. And there was this notion since day one of the war that oh, this phase is going to take like a week or two maximum. And look at us now after 10 months since we're still talking about the war and we're still talking about the notion of it's going to take a, two, uh, a week or two. Um, I think I'll stop here and yeah, continue discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I think, yeah, it's working. So I had this very long essay, <laughs> which um, I, I won't go into, um, because um, I want to speak a little bit about more the geopolitics of the situation in Sudan, which is very complicated and uh, uh, depressing. But um, essentially, um, I, I think before I talk about the geopolitics of the current moment, I think it's important just to sort of situate Sudan a bit in relation to where this geopolitics comes from, like what is the history of it. Um, Sudan is a country that had experienced uh, many, you know, not in its current necessarily modern form with its current borders, but it had experienced as a territory, as a land long periods of colonial rule, first by the Ottomans and then from the late 19th century by the British in a, a very um, somewhat unique form of colonial government because Britain was colonizing Egypt, but Britain and Egypt together were co 
colonizing Sudan, which is to the south of Egypt. The definite uh, major partner in that colonial project was, of course, the British, because they were the masters uh, in Egypt. And initially, the colonial project, I mean, the interest in Sudan was not so much about Sudan itself, but it was about securing Egypt as a colony, because the, a major resource in Egypt is the Nile water, and the Nile flowed from Sudan into Egypt. So Egypt was a recipient country of Nile waters. So if you look at the history of Egypt in relation to its, the southern countries, uh, to southern territories, Sudan and Ethiopia, up to the point, from the point of the pharaohs and the Abyssinian, uh, Ethiopian, you know, we call Ethiopian now, emperors, a lot of the politics in that region has to do with Egypt's uh, need to secure uh, the water, which is the lifeline in the country. And so the British initially were interested in Sudan in order to make sure that nobody else, for example, the French, controlled the waters of the Nile or the source of the waters of the Nile. But uh, the colonial project evolved to, to be opportunistically where, for example, the British developed an economy uh, of uh, cotton. So if you look at the history of many African countries, including Sudan, you know, you see the, you see the emergence in the 20th century of cash crops, you know, crops that are grown, uh, cultivated to be exported into the global market. And so in Sudan, the main crop was cotton. And so the cotton was, uh, the British developed an economic system where cotton was being grown in the central region in between the Blue and the White Nile um, in order to be exported to Manchester and other cities where there was a massive textile industry, textile factories. And so I won't go very deeply into it, but to say that part of the colonial project um, in Sudan as it was elsewhere, was also a civilizing mission. So there's a lot of really interesting history and work uh, just looking at the British colonial archive in relation to the role of British women in uh, you know, so-called uh, civilizing Sudanese women. So a lot of the work focused on, um, the colonial work focused on interventions by the British colonial government in Sudan in things like reproductive health. So some of these ideas you see today in the continent about um, there's, it's over, you know, the, the, the developing the global south is overpopulated. So ideas about family planning, but the major focus was on the practice of uh, female genital cutting. So there's a lot of interesting histories that set up both um, white feminists, if we could use that word for those colonial women at the time, as kind of guardians of these uncivilized women that have to be civilized and taught. And then in 1956, when Sudan gained its independence, um, the post-colonial government continued a lot of similar practices to the colonial regime. So there were breaks, of course, there were differences, but there were also continuities. And some of these continuities are what we see in action also to this day. Um, one of these continuities is um, the extractive economy, essentially. So um, the, the central government, based in Khartoum, this is the case with both military regimes as well as civilian regimes, because Sudan's history, I don't think we went very much into it, but Sudan's post-colonial history is a swing between, if I, if I simplified it, it's a swing between military regimes that are then overthrown by popular uprisings, where you have a few years of um, elections of multi-party rule and civic life and civil society life, and then there's another coup and another military regime that then gets overthrown through organizing, and so there is this kind of dynamic and this cycle. And within that period, probably no more than 11 years since 1956, have we had elected governments actually in power in Sudan. So I think this gives you a sense of how militarized the political space actually is, because the, main, the major political player in Sudan is the military. 
So in terms of the geopolitics of the moment, Maysoon and Samah both spoke about the revolution and about the role of women within the revolution. And of course, the role of women within the revolution is partly a result of decades and decades of um, organizing by women in different spaces, partly because the al-Bashir regime um, targeted women in very particular ways. And I think I want to pause here and talk about which women as well, because I think that really matters if we're really speaking from a feminist perspective. We have to look at the history of um, the, the states the state's policy towards women was also different depending on the intersectionality of these women, the kind of specific oppressions that they faced. So going back to my point about the extractive economy, the central government continued this process of extracting from regions of the country far from Khartoum, regions like Darfur in the west, or like Kurdufan also in the west, like South Sudan, prior to South Sudan's independence. And these resources flowed from these regions into the center and into global markets. And of course, the resources themselves changed over time. So in the 90s, you see a move away from the agricultural economy of cotton and sesame and groundnuts and things like that. And you see a shift towards oil, because now you see the era of the exploration of oil, which meant that a lot of agricultural land and, and projects like the Jazeera scheme where, you know, colonial projects but that many, many farmers depended on are being broken up, up and sold piece by piece. And many other industries, the gum Arabic industry in Kurdufan, which many families participate in, which many women are involved in, in terms of agriculture, also being broken down and so forth. And so, Really, uh, the, when we talk, for example, in Sudan about one of the main pillars of the policies of the al-Bashir regime, we talk about the public order laws, which were laws put in the early 1990s, and that were basically used to control and police women's bodies and women's behavior in different spaces, but especially in the public space. And these laws affected uh, all women, but if you were a racialized poor woman who had been displaced to Khartoum from Darfur, from Kurdufan, from southern Sudan, you were, women are concentrated in terms of work in the informal sector. So they're working in markets, they're working in the street. They are being confronted daily by these uh, laws that are attacking them and using their basically presence and bodies in the public sphere as a threat that has to be policed, but also as an economic source. So for example, you're a tea seller that's selling tea on the street. You, you know, the locality, the police, the public order police, they can come and take away, and they did continuously take away your um, equipment and confiscated it and then sold it back to you at times, right? So you see this incredibly deepening process of impoverization that affected women and children. Um, I think we have to talk about girls because we often, when we talk about African women, we say women, but actually Sudan is a very young country. So a lot, uh, I mean, I think it's 61% of the population of Sudan um, to the best estimates because um, demographics and census is a very political thing but 61% uh, of the population is under the age of 25, so the majority is young, very different to Germany in that way, for example, and most of those are actually children, so they're young women and children. And so, essentially, all of this history and all of this background comes into women organizing themselves in different spaces, already from the 1950s against the colonial regime, but you see also in the 1990s and in the 2000s, for example, the tea sellers and uh, you know, women who sell tea and food organizing themselves into kind of a union-like structure in order to also fight for their rights. You see women in different parts of the areas that are targeted by war also organizing themselves. I won't get too deeply into the whole political kind of geopolitics scene because it's, um, 
it would take too long, but I want to illustrate the relationship of two countries, specifically to Sudan, by using the example of the RSF. So as um, Antonia and Maysoon mentioned, the RSF is the militia that's fighting this war right now against the military, which actually uh, came out of the military. So until quite recently, we thought of the RSF and the military as two sides of the same coin. And, um, and this is you know, a fallout to do with a, a fight over power and resources over this extractive economy, but it's also, of course, um, a counter-revolutionary move. So essentially, you know, Sudan has one of the most sustained revolutionary movements in the world that wasn't quite snuffed out and wasn't able to get rid of the military. And so the war has been extremely effective in a way as a counter-revolutionary process of Remilitarizing uh, the public space and kind of um, bringing a different kind of priority whereby the military can then present itself as a savior, right? So, this is something maybe we can talk about more in the QA. Um, but essentially, if you look at the history of the RSF, often when I speak to audiences in Europe and in Germany, they kind of think of the war in Sudan as something very unrelated to them. Um, in fact, the Rapid Support Forces is a militia that was formed um, around uh, 2013, and it was formed by al-Bashir specifically from the, the remnants, the leftovers of the Janjaweed militias that had committed genocide in Darfur in the 2000s. And that, the Janjaweed were quite well known. These are our tribal uh, militias that were quite well known for using rape as a weapon of war. So the Darfur uh, conflict, which continues today, is a conflict that is very much about um, was being fought on women's bodies. So women and girls and children were burned out of their villages, specifically from specific ethnic groups, burned out of their villages and you know, there was rape on mass scale, and that was one of the tactics of the war. So the RSF was formed out of the remainder of these militias, and it was formed to protect the al-Bashir regime, but also to fight um, his wars in a way that was, he considered it much more light, lighter, faster than the military, which was kind of, you know, it's, it's the Sudanese military, but it still has rules and orders and hierarchies. And he wanted something faster that could also defend him against the military if it was needed. But very quickly, the RSF started also becoming border guards. And the reason they became border guards is because at that point, the European Union, led by Germany, had formed a deal with the al-Bashir regime and neighboring countries uh, that's called the Khartoum process, actually. And the deal was officially about fighting human trafficking, or combating human trafficking, and making safe routes for migration. But of course, people that know Germany and what was happening at that time, particularly in relation to Syria, know that EU policy at the time was very much focused on border control, migration control, and on basically fortress Europe. So in effect, the Khartoum process was about preventing people's ability to cross into Libya in particular, because Sudan is a country that borders Libya and borders Egypt, two countries on the Mediterranean, and Libya was the main route of Eritreans, Ethiopians, Sudanese, and many others. And so the German regime actually collaborated, the German government actually collaborated with the al-Bashir regime in relation to migration control. And this explains the ambivalent position that it had to the revolution, because it had been investing in mediation, trying to kind of reform the al-Bashir regime and maybe stabilize it because it was, it was very weak. Um, there is a lot that I could say about other interests. I think the UAE is also a very interesting um, country because the United Arab Emirates um, has a big investment in gold, particularly from Sudan, which the RSF controls a lot of. 80% of Sudan's gold is smuggled into the international market via the UAE, and actually the UAE is also you know, heavily involved historically with land grabbing in the country. And the UAE, of course, is a partner of Germany. There's a lot of trade, there's weapons sales to the UAE, and so forth. Um, 
What's very important to think about is, and I think I will leave with this just very final point, um, over the last, since 2002, um, the European governments, the EU, Germany, the US, have been involved in what it's called peace building efforts in Sudan, mediation efforts. And these mediation efforts, which continue to this day, right, um, there have been se several peace agreements. Uh, the, the, the best one is the 2005 one that, that um, was between the rebel movement in the south and the government it was called the Comprehensive Peace Agreement because it was supposed to be the peace to end all peace. There will never be a problem again. And so, of course, both in Sudan and in South Sudan, war and conflict continued. The model has not changed very much in those years. So these are patriarchal uh, structures, closed door, secret negotiations, mediated usually by um, the UN, backed by Western countries, or in some cases, more and more, the African Union or IGAD regional bodies backed by Western countries. And the conception of gender issues and women's issues is that there are moments when you bring a delegation of women in to represent women, or women's position. Um, all the men that are there are representing the whole issue, but the women are brought in in specific moments to represent what should happen in relation to women. And that model, amazingly, I've been studying this for 20, almost 20 years now, has not changed, which is flab it's amazing. Um, essentially, that model, even by its own goals, has failed because every process of negotiation has actually resulted in an entrenchment of the power structure. And that is because these processes continuously center these patriarchal militarized structures at the heart of the political process, right? And ignore all of the movements, the civil, civil movements, the experiences of people of what it means to live in peace, which is not the same as the absence of war, right? So I'm going to leave it here maybe, and in the discussion we can pick up on some of these things. Thank you. Thank you for your very interesting inputs. Um, now we will have a panel discussion and while listening you can also think about the own questions that you have because you will have the opportunity to ask them afterwards. I would like to start with a question to you, Summer. You said you were also on the streets in 2018-19. Can you describe a bit how was it on the streets in this time and how did especially also women and queer people shape this revolution? Okay, thank you. Um, first, I will start with, <laughs> in Sudan, um, the concept of self-identifying as a feminist is very much similar to the global LGBT concept of coming out. My personal experience was no different. <laughs> When I first identified myself as a feminist, uh, my brother's immediate reaction was, Inti Kafra, are you an unbeliever? Um, so this immediate uh, association showcases the depth of the negative stereotypes um, against feminists, um, especially the young feminists. Um, to answer your question, um, the efforts of women in Sudan traced back, traced back to the formation of uh, Sudanese Women Union in 1952. But feminism as, um, as a concept and as implementation um, was introduced into Sudan in the late 1990s. Um, similar like the neighboring countries as well. Um, and since then, women have been challenged um, to be listened to, and they were always sidelined or overshadowed with other political issues, let's say. Um, in 2013, there were also protests um, in Sudan, September 2013, where 200 people were killed. And so when the revolution started in 2018. People were afraid, of course. 
to face again the same level of the violence from the state. Um, so I remember that day really well. Uh, I saw a Facebook post from um, not very much known for us, uh, which was called back, back then with, with the um, Sudanese People Association, the Jamal Sudanese Mihani, calling people to take on the streets to protest against the increasing prices um, of uh, gas and bread. Um, the immediate reaction was to be sure that I'm safe and I'm not going to tell anyone that I'm going to the protest tomorrow. I only told one person, and that was my best friend, who is queer as well. So I remember that day very well. I entered the Sugal Arabi, which uh, is the very center of Khartoum, the gathering point. And I felt that, I mean, I saw female doctors on the front lines, front lines, lawyers, and all of a sudden, I saw my colleagues from the organization. Back then, I used to work for a civil organization. We didn't tell each other that you are going to the to the straight tomorrow. So I looked on my right. I found my friend on my left, and immediately I felt safe. And we started chanting. Okay, let me tell you. Uh, Amir al-Bashir came to the power in 1989, and I was born in 1991. So when I was in the demonstration, I'm like. Hell yeah, let's bring a new president. I'm like, no, this this man had been in power for for 30 years. And his regime, the ideology, the ideology that he presented and he adopted uh, the Islamization or the civilization project, which aims to Islamization and Arabization of the whole nation, that poses a lot of restrictions of, uh, on women and queer people. So I felt people were angry. Um, and immediately the demands went from uh, the economic kind of challenges into no, we demand that for al-Bashir to fall. That's what, that's what, that's what was. So, um, and by January we started like losing our friends who got killed soon in the protest. So we reached a point that where there was no way back. And April was the turning point. We entered the sit-in area, we were millions celebrating our freedom. And the visibility of the queer community in the sit-in area was remarkable. I mean, you could have seen like rainbows and Male, uh, male-looking people with the toe and the scars. I mean, people felt the freedom. People practiced the freedom in that space. And after only five days, Al Bashir was done, <laughs> and it was our victory at that time. As queer people, as women, as feminists. Um, Anyhow, um, after that, what happened? Um, according to Allah Salah in one of the uh, Human Rights Council uh, sessions, she mentioned that women and girls formed 70% of the protesters. But women have been again sidelined when it comes to political representation, mm -hmm. when it comes to achieving the demands that we took the streets for. Um, on the other hand, women and feminists never um, surrender, never surrender. Um, I got, for the first time, I got to participate in feminist marches, which was uh, never the case for Sudan. Women were invading, literally, the public spaces and the civic spaces. Um, the, the concept of women for women. We took the sisterhood and solidarity from it, so the very romanticized notion into that practice by saying women to women, by participating in marches, by uh, demanding justice uh, for women, by asking 
to amend the laws and, and so on. Um, also, social media campaigns such as We Only Believe in Survivors, that that platform um, opens an opportunity for women who are going through harassment and um, other form of violations to talk about it to, um, and to let other women to show also solidarity. Maybe I can ask there. Yeah. Um, Sarah also talked about the intersectionality of of the patriarchal violence that has been in, in Sudan for a long time, that for example, racialized women and poor women, they are affected more by the discrimination of the government and then also of the military. How has this intersectional discrimination been addressed in the sit-in areas when the people came together and how have also maybe some Sudanese people who have been in rather privileged situations learned about um, their intersectional violence that has been there during the revolution, which learnings have been there? Hmm. Okay, so I wouldn't be very naive and say that the sit-in area was was free of violence, no. Uh, it didn't happen to me personally, but there have been some uh, stories which have been documented, um, stories of harassment in the sit-in area from other protests, protesters, um, stories of, um, uh, for example, um, if um, a girl or a woman is smoking on the street, it also brings her um, negative street type and it it is it escalates of course um, but one thing is we were able to dress as we want for the first time Sarah mentioned the order uh, public order law which uh, that in this specific law uh, puts restriction on how women should dress Everything we did in the sit-in area was a political statement indeed. It was setting the tone for the next as women and girls. What, what do we want to see? What, the change, what is the change that we are aiming for? Um, talking about intersectionality, um, post-revolution time, there was publicly, uh, there was some of, uh, of the feminist groups which were established right after the revolution. And in the, the modern history of Sudan, it was the first time that feminist groups acknowledge the queer subjects in their statements. This, this is one of the very, let's say, gains of the revolution, is to acknowledge the intersectionality publicly and to be ready to take on the fight and the attack and the stigma from the society. Um, okay. Okay, sorry. That's yes. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to speak a bit more about the women organizing during the revolution and afterwards, and maybe I would like to ask a question to you, my soon. Um, you already mentioned the emergency rooms and the resistance committee, which already formed during the revolutions and which keep being active up to now during the war. Can you maybe elaborate a bit what are those resistance committees? And how do they represent feminist political action? Um, I guess just to give a background on how the resistance committees work, I think we need to address, like, so in the beginning, in the introduction, we talked about Sudan being the invisible war. Uh, but it's also important to say that the Sudanese revolution has also been the invisible revolution. Um, it took a time to get support and international solidarity. Um, and it was faced with criticism when it first started. I mean, I remember getting, you know, like seeing these, reading these posts from colleagues in the Arab world saying, oh, you're, too, you're coming too late to the Arab Spring. And oh, let, let us give you advice how to, over, and, and, and this is going to, it's not, this is not going to go well, you know, learn from us of what happened in the, in the Arab Spring. And I think for many people, um, the revolution in Sudan was invisible because it's addressed something that I think many countries um, in the region, but also 
um, you know, in the you know in the global north have not yet experienced, and that is the complete disintegration of the state of the central state. Um, and the this disintegrating of the state has started since the beginning of the Bashir rule. I mean, we focus on saying that you know the Islam is true, like the Islam is. Um, uh, we have a focus on the word like the Islamist, but the the project itself was a very like uh, you know ingenious, <laughs> um, uh, you know project which understood that um, you know to to you know form power there was a need to you know disintegrate these central institutions, and that's why the you know the Bashir dictatorship was the longest dictatorship. It continued for thirty years. And that is by you know targeting those institutions that if they fall, the whole regime falls. So what it happened? It decentralized oppression. You know, so it decentralized oppression where if you, for example, you know all the universities in Sudan, which is how usually uh, you know the former coups were addressed, like universities and you know those labor unions were marching to the streets of Khartoum and you know um, the, the army institution would side with the protesters and that's it, uh, a regime would end. But then during the Bashir regime, you know, people march in the streets and nothing happened. Uh, you know, because you know oppression was everywhere and the you know you know the agents like it it um, how do I say like it it subcontracted you know um, you know oppression you know to different agents you know inclu including the you know rapid uh, support forces and uh, so what we were and so it took a while for people to understand how to you know address this kind of oppression and and we can you know trace these roots to the 2013 September uprising when. The Bashir regime brought in the rapid support forces for the first time from Darfur in Khartoum to face, um, you know, the demonstrators. It was one of the, you know, largest, uh, you know, uprisings uh, during the whole, you know, 30-year, um, you know, rule of Bashir. And so, what people learned very quickly was that um, the rapid support forces, while they acclimated themselves to the main streets, they were able to, you know, attack protesters in the main streets. The protesters started declining to their neighborhoods. And that's where they knew the rapid support, like they didn't know the geography or the neighborhoods. Even the state, you know, the, the police, the army were unfamiliar with, you know, the geography of like, uh, you know, neighborhoods and, you know, this is, and, and, and we saw videos at the time of, of, you know, police cars and rapid support cars like falling into, you know, you know holes and pits that the protesters know about, but the police doesn't know about. So, um, yeah, so, and, and, and I think from that point, this kind of you know, organizing within the neighborhood, um, uh, uh, only as a tactic, uh, uh, you know, as, a, uh, as a, like a tactic used by protesters to you know, face the violence of the state, started, the route started from there. They understood the potential of, you know, of decentralized organizing. Um, but, but not beyond that. And that's why when the 2018 revolution started, and even though, and even then you could see like these roots of, you know, um, decentralized organization, because, um, you know, when the revolution started, uh, 2018, just to give you like a timeline, January 2018, um, the political elite called for, you know, a great protest to, you know, face, you know, the Bashir, uh, you know, rule. And I think around a thousand people marched. I think it was organized by the Sudanese Communist Party and other parties. You know, a thousand marched in the middle of Khartoum. It was quickly dispersed, and that was it. And, you know, everybody was, it was a, everybody was like, it was a cynical time. You know, people were saying like, you know, nothing, we, we will never get rid of the Bashir regime. And I remember just a few days before the December revolution. So that's like 11 months later. I remember like posting something saying like, oh, we, you know, nothing will ever happen, like we will never do anything. And just a few days later, protests started in a more, in the most unlikely of places. It started in, um, you know, in the, in the Mayirnu, which is, um, you know, a, a city or a small town, um, uh, you know, within the borders of, you know, Sinar State, which is like in the, around the southern borders, not, not quite to the south. Um, and uh, it was organized by uh, school students. And they took to the streets, and then, uh, and so this idea that political organization usually comes from the center, from Khartoum, where the you know the privilege, but this time it was organized from the peripheries. They were the one who took action, and 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 from then you know people who were following the political, 
you know, the political uh, you know, situation in Sudan, you know, notice that there, there's something different happening here. And so, um, but then, you know, the traditional also, as, you know, um, Samah mentioned, uh, like the, the Sudanese Professional Association, uh, along with the, uh, you know, political elite who rebranded themselves as the, you know, forces of free freedom and change, you know, started organizing in the main streets of Khartoum, and, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the state, uh, you know, agents, know how to crack, crack down on the you know, main streets. They know how to you know, disperse the protests. And that's when the tactics changed. And there was a call for the protests to start from the neighborhoods. And, um, and this was, it was a call from uh, people on the street. They felt that they needed to protect themselves. Uh, they can't be an easy target to the state. And so they started organizing from the neighborhoods, from different kinds, you know, different, uh, you know, from different places, and um, and then and, and and create these organizing committees. And they had different roles, whether it's providing, you know, protest tactics, uh, you know, providing food, um, and medical aid uh, for the protesters. And so you would see on the first days of the of the revolution, you know, people carrying, you know, juice and food and you know, sandwiches and preparing like a head. Uh, you know, a day ahead of the protest and, you know, creating these medical rooms uh, because hospitals as well were targeted. Um, and so the, the committee started form, formed with the task of, you know, supporting the protests. We still didn't have a political role, but supporting the protests. Um, um, and, and this, um, you know, continued until the organization of the sit-in. And you can see the resistance committees, you know, having this, you know, broader role of like organizing the sit-in and protecting the sit-in, and also, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, voicing, voicing like the slogans of the revolution. At that, that time, everybody thought like this was one unit, like we and you know the the political elite and the, you know this uh, the Sudanese professional association which is like a union platform you know a white collar kind of white collar platform union and we were all you know voicing the same broad demands you know but once the 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 the, the, um, the fall of Bashir, Bashir was imminent and they started or uh, actually after the fall of Bashir and his um, you know his security council still the you know the still the actors of the previous regime started this negotiation with the political elite. This is when we see the disintegration between what we call the street uh, and or the people's demands and the political elite. Um, and so you know, there was this chasm between both of them. And then that, that's when we see the, um, the, the, the resistance committees or the organization on the ground starting to form their own political you know, voice away from the political elite. So the political elite were, were um, you know, engaged in negotiating um, a deal. And the people in the street were demanding, like, we want to know what's going on. I think like Sarah said, like, no more closed doors. We, want to, we don't want the traditional way of doing politics. We want to know what's happening between closed doors. We want to see what, what document you're signing. And we, we, we want to, uh, you know, define who, who sits with who and which actors we want you to negotiate with. Um, and of course, that the political elite, you know, just you know, continues to protect its privileges. And um, and um, and even then, you would see, like, um, I think you mentioned, you know, Antonio, like, did people like, uh, you know, the Khartoum sitting, like people with privilege, did they recognize, you know, the, the marginalized people? Was there that kind of intersectionality? So I think we, we forgot to mention the area of Colombia. Uh, which was, you know, renamed Colombia, which were, uh, you know, the it was a part of the sit-in or in the periphery of the sit-in, which, you know, had the people who come from the, you know, you know, peripheries and 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 who were engaged in what could you call like, um, you know, periphery economic activities, whether it's uh, you know the selling of you know local alcohol or you know some kinds of you know, you know. Um, um, I don't know, weed or whatever, and um, and and one of the tactics of dispersing the sitting was targeting this this area and saying like, oh, you know, Colombia, there are people who are doing immoral stuff, and and, and uh, it needs to be dispersed. And unfortunately, we saw the political elite also embracing that uh, that that language of the you know the the the, uh, the army and the, uh, the security council saying like, oh yeah, these are like bad behavior, and we want people to all have like this kind of moral, you know, middle class, you know, more morality. And it was the people of the street who said, no, Colombia is part of the revolution. These people, this periphery is part of the revolution and, and they need to be protected and they cannot be targeted. 
Um, and then, but this later on, you know, escalated uh, into the dispersal of the, the, and the massacre of the of the sit-in, and and this was, I think, the complete chasm between the the, the people in the streets. Although now the the resistance committees, instead of being just you know like support and logistics, <laughs> started you know having their own you know political voice, and um, and so they started. Uh, uh, and this continued so after the the signing of the the, the um, what is called the constitutional uh, document, uh, which which created the partnership between the the you know the political elite, the freedom of forces and change, and the um, and the and the you know the, the the leaders of the army and the RSF. So they created this political organization. Um, the the resistance committees continued to provide the slogans that opposed this partnership, which they called the partnership of blood. This is a partnership of blood. And the you would notice the protests never stopped and continued. And we will see this even through the formation of the government and uh, you know up to um, when the, we talk about the coup d'etat that happened against the civilian-led government in, um, I think it was in the 21st um, of October 2021, just a few days before it, the resistance committees were marching in the streets saying, you know, we don't want a partnership, uh, you know, with the uh, army and the RSF. And then the coup happened and the resistance committees, you know, continued their slogan, which is at that time, no partnership, no negotiation, um, what was it, uh, no legitimacy, and no giving legitimacy to the army and the RSF, um, political legitimacy. And um, yeah, so that continued, and then as they got emboldened, so this was just slogans, and then uh, that was late October, so like we see um, in the next four or five months, they felt the need that these slogans need to have a more like solid ground, and this is when we started seeing the talk about having our own um, uh, what do you call it, our, our, our own political statement. And the first political statement, look, at, it's like almost like a round circle, was the political statement of Mayumu, where the first protests started in December 2018. So 2000 and um, you know early 2022 was the Mayumu political statement, which talked about um, you know. How the state looks like uh, about the you know um, uh, about the you know political structure and th their vision of, uh, of of you know the Sudan that they want to live in, and then later on um, uh, more of the resistance committees started uh, you know for uh, sitting together and there was you know workshops and it was a kind of new kind of political you know organizing that we haven't seen before. So this the forming of the document was to a great extent, you know, open and shared with people. So this was like, um, you know, many, uh, you know, uh, uh, members, you know, of the, it was like an open discussion of forming the, the document of the political statement, the political document, um, um, uh, which ended, so the, this whole process ended uh, in March 2022, which, uh, you know, brought out the, um, uh, the, the revolutionary, um, uh, um, uh, I, keep, I keep forgetting the translation, but the, I don't know if somebody can help me. The revolutionary, I think, uh, sure. document of um, of uh, I think forming the like the the. Uh, I can't remember the English translation, but it was the but it was like the formal like um, you know political statement that was embraced by all the. The, uh, the 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 resistance committees and it was the reference of you know what they embody and what they represent um, and and it's very interesting that um, as the you know political elite call for you know a united front they keep ignoring that political document so they want the resistance committees to join them as bodies you know do the protests for us do the chantings for us. Uh, we do the political negotiation, so they they ignore the like this this, this political independence of uh, of the resistance committees. Um, uh, I don't know what the so this is like the this is who are the resistance committees. I, I don't remember if there was another question, um, and 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 I still I don't think we can still say like what are the resistance committees. I st I still think that they are defining who they are uh, in terms of organization. 
and what they represent and you know and and and, uh, and, and, and their political vision I, I still think this is like still you know st still being formed as you know as time goes on I think it is clear that the current war is a backlash against the work of the resistance committees and also against the achievements of the feminist movements of the past years. Sama, I would still like to ask you before we get to the open discussion, how has the war affected women and especially queer people? Uh, yes, how has the war affected them? Okay. Um. Well, firstly, we can't take the war as an isolated event. I mean, historically, queer people have been denied by the system and by the society. The war is just presenting another layers of challenge. Um, and exa in examining the dynamics of the war, uh, we should also um, see and acknowledge the role of the family, because a lot of queer people find themselves confined with their families um, and the family here um, is not only a biological connection, it's also the applicant of the social cultural hegemonies on the people. So a lot of queer people are facing not only emotional but physical abuse from their families as well. Also the, the religious rioting um, in Sudan which puts the blame on queer people and the feminists, in specific the young feminists, for the social illness, which also causes a narrative of let's attack them. They are the reason. And here is why we need a counter uh, narrative um, to, um, to not victimize uh, the queer uh, resilience and the feminist resilience in the time of the war. Thank you for your insights, Sama. I would now like to give the word to you. Um, there's somebody with a microphone, so you can just raise your hand maybe if you have a question and ask it. You can, you can also ask questions in German. Ihr könnt auch auf Deutsch Fragen stellen und die werden dann übersetzt. Hello and uh, thank you so much for for sharing your experiences and your knowledge. My name is Aida and I would like to know um, how the resistance committees like work decentrally because I'm guessing that um, the way they form is by people learning from other people and learning from experiences and then I'm guessing that they also focus on different uh, things depending on the political group that they are trying to protect or represent. Um, so how do they kind of work as a collective even though they are decentral? Um, how do they communicate? I think this is a question that maybe my soon you can answer best. Thank you. Um, so they have you know many ways to communicate so if you're talking about like logistics um uh, you know they have i think this is and this is like this is what the advantage of you know decentralized organization or grassroots organization is like they can always adapt to you know different situations like i remember during the uh, when the regime used to do the internet cuts um you know they found ways to coordinate with each other it was through like um, you know, um, you know, secret pamphlets or, you know, you know, motorcycles and so on. But politically, they have formed what are called like coordinates or tanziria, which, which has a group of resistance. So every, you know, um, area, you know, geographical area will have several resistance committees, you know, under it. Um, so they still have their, you know, they still use like, um, you know, you know, apps or social media to, to you know, organize, uh, but um, uh, um, you know there is still kind of a flexibility. When we say like they they copy each other's models, it's still different, you know, and acclimated to wh wherever they are. So when we talk like about you know emergency rooms, it's different from area to area. Uh, it's either people who repurpose a medical center in the area, 
or people who can't repurpose a medical center because there is no medical center in the area. So they, you know, um, you know, assign a house to become an emergency room. Um, if we talk about, like I said, neighborhood kitchens, there are those who are able to, you know, cook ready meals and, you know, uh, and, and share it with the neighborhood. But others who have the ability to, you know, you know buy the basic needs and so, and just disseminate it to, uh, and, you know, um, you know the, to, to the houses, and each house will have their own kind of, you know, put their whole, own basic needs. So it's different from place to place, um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, they share their experiences publicly of how they form, and how to form an emergency room, how to firm, form a neighborhood, um, you know, kitchen, and so um, uh, they copy and they acclimate, um, you know, these, um, you know, these models, you know, across Sudan. But they have, you know, created these um, um, you know, um, connection um, channels that are so effective, like I said, like from the first day of the war, you know, they were able to, you know, create these, uh, um, you know, these unified ta tasks and duties where whether it's sharing information about safe routes. And so this is, when I talk about safe routes, so this is like organizing from one city across like different regions. So they would, you know, give you full information about how to take a safe route from one point to another point. Um, yeah, I hope this answers the question. Yeah, I just wanted to like add on to what Misun said. Um, um, often when you talk to them, they describe to members of the committees. They describe um, they describe their organizational form as tashbiki, like networked, networked organizing rather than hierarchical organizing. So um, a lot of it is about. Essentially, the strength that they have is that they work at the area level, at the neighborhood level. But then it's very hard to, because they're not NGOs and they've resisted very much being turned into NGOs over the years. They have, their structures, as Mesun has said, have evolved over time. So I remember, for example, the period when the RCs felt that now they needed spokespersons of the coordinating bodies and so forth, which they didn't have before. And they kind of evolved in this way based on what was politically needed at that moment. And so um, I think this is very important because it's uh, much more organic. I think it's also important to say that, if, you know, since we're on a feminist panel, um, it's, um, there are definitely many women who are members of the resistance committees or active in them. Um, but there have also been... Um, there has also been work to increase by feminists and by women activists to increase the, the uh, membership of women at the resistance committees, right? So basically there are still predominantly male structures, right? And so basically, for example, there was a campaign a few, uh, I think it was like two years ago now, called Legna, which means enter the committee. And this was a campaign by women activists um, um, women and queer activists that really going, pushing for women to go into the committees, right? And there are feminists who don't choose to organize with the committees either, right? They organize in other spaces. So I think this is very important to see that as you see across the region in different movements, depending on your positionality towards the dominant structures, and sometimes the dominant structure is the dominant feminist movement or women's movement, for example, you know, um, whatever it is, you see people based on their intersections fighting on multiple fronts. So fighting with the committees and fighting against the committees in some cases as well. Um, thank you very much for this thought-provoking panel um, and the insights. I actually have two questions. So one question is about um, the current humanitarian um, situation that you have um, already pointed out how the resistance committees even helped the um, different foreign um, whatever, foreign um, actors, etc., to evacuate their staff. Um, so why wasn't any, why was there no collaboration with the resistance committees to enable humanitarian aid and dire needed humanitarian aid in Sudan? Um, how can we understand that? 
Um, so that's one question. And the other question is about the geopolitics, as you have mentioned. Um, so the geopolitics of the war right now. Um, why is it, or what are the interests, foreign interests, in the current war? Um, and maybe also to uh, a side note, uh, to roll out some confusion maybe that uh, it, the recording will not be published, but it is still being recorded. Um, it is the agreement that we might use some of the um, parts of uh, the current panel for further mutual um, public work. So to roll out the confusion there. I think maybe we can start with those with answering Raghav's questions. It's very difficult um, with the humanitarian situation. The thing to say is that I think we talked about the figures, the overwhelming figures that make the current humanitarian context in Sudan one of the worst in the world. Um, it's getting up there to be in terms of number is the worst in terms of displacement, for sure. Um, but uh, it's very hard to have one strategy for all of Sudan because it's a very large country, very complex. In different places, different things are happening. Um, the organization itself of the resistance committees is different in different places. And the movement is affected by the war because a lot of these activists themselves, particularly the ones from Darfur and also from Khartoum, two of the areas that have seen the, some of the worst fighting um, in the war, they are helping and themselves displaced and themselves dealing with you know the violence itself so while um, there is forms of organization that remain and new forms of organization that will no doubt uh, um, also reveal themselves i think you know to to think a bit more critically about the current moment and its effect on the movement i think it's really important to to really be in the present um the, there, it's a challenge right now. This is a really, this is one of the biggest challenges, I think, to the movement in general right now. And one of the reasons it's a big challenge is because one of the biggest tools that the resistance committees have had over the last years, as well as other revolutionary movements, is the street, is organizing people on the street. And what war does is it often takes away the street as a, as a terrain, as a space of organizing. So it's actually interesting to think about um, one of the first, in the, in the first weeks of the war, one of the first videos that I saw of a public uh, demonstration or public event was actually by a group called the Mothers of Sudan um, in Blue Nile. And some of the people in that group are feminists who, for example, organize with a, an organization, with a, an, an, an NGO, an, an organ, a collective called Why Awareness. It's a, it's a feminist collective. And they're in Blue Nile, which is um, um, a state that is, had a lot of history of state violence against the, the ethnic groups and the people that live in it, and it's also a place of a lot of recruitment by the militias because of the, you know, the collapse. I mean, there's the war, the military war, but there's also capitalism. Sudan has a long history of structural adjustment, of privatization, of essentially the, the breakdown um, by the global order and by the Sudanese government of people's livelihoods, particularly rural livelihoods and the lives of people who rely on um, rely on working with their hands, working in fields, working in factories. And so um, in Blue Nile, the mothers of Sudan, their, um, their, this was in the early weeks, their demonstration was essentially a few of them standing and basically saying, we reject the military, we reject the RSF, we are not going to allow our sons to fight in this war. Because one of the biggest things that feminists are trying to do is to say that we, there is a third way. It's not the RSF and it's not the military. 
we have to fight the militarization of the public space. We have to defend ourselves in different ways. And so I think this is one of the biggest things that they're trying to do. So they were standing there saying, we are not, we, are ha we have to fight to stop our sons from being drawn into this war, right? And I think this is really important because you see this video out in Blue Nile and it feels, even if you're in Khartoum, it feels like it's another place, another country. But all of these things are bubbling up. But if you read an article about the war, it's about the negotiations in Saudi Arabia between the RSF and the military, right? And so this is where the feminist perspective is really important because this world where people are living and where they're fighting for what in Sudan often, you know, the civil society would say the right to life. It's a very different understanding of the right to life than in the US, right, where it's about the abortion debate. The right to life is the right to be alive, the right to live without violence, the right to live in dignity, and that's what people are fighting for. And so I think the, the, to answer your question very simply, uh, it's not possible on that scale to allow that level of humanitarian intervention. If you're in the East, if you're in the Red Sea, where like this is where the this is where the humanitarian industry has relocated from Khartoum into Port Sudan because it's right on the Red Sea and you can get out of the country quickly if you have to. I mean, I mean it's a good it's a good strategic reason. A lot of people have moved there, but essentially the port is controlled by the military. So humanitarian aid coming in is controlled by the military. In Darfur, if you're trying to bring aid in through Chad, you have to negotiate not just with the RSF but with multiple militias along the way. In the north you have the Egyptian regime which is its, its own machine, its own power structure, right, that is militarized as well. Um, in the south of Sudan you're dealing with a conflict in the south itself and the fact that already along the borders you have you know, hundreds of thousands of people who have been stuck there since 2013 living in camps in White Nile, right? And so it's, this is one aspect of it, but the other aspect of it is, you know, there's an ambivalent feeling about humanitarian aid in the traditional sense, right? Because people are engaging in mutual aid work constantly. And why is this work not really being supported, I think is the real question. Why is it so difficult to get support for the fact that people are organizing themselves? Um, does it have to look like trucks rolling in? In some places, probably yes, because of the breakdown of the ability to, for example, grow food. But in other places, especially the places where people have fled in order to get safety in some parts of the country, you can support people who are already working to provide. So this is something that I think it's a question to the humanitarian community. Um, there's a lot of talk about localization in the discourse of the humanitarian community over the last years. I don't see it. I've, I've worked in the sector. It's more talk than anything else at this point. There is a massive industry, and the industry works in particular ways, and it's difficult to change. Um, I don't think I can answer the question about foreign interest because it would take too long, but Egypt has surprisingly is engaged in the conflict, but not the Egyptian regime is engaged in the conflict but not as much as some people expected because of course it's a client state of the US and the US has been also holding back, but Egypt as a military regime has always supported military regimes in Sudan. So its position is clear. It is uh, uh, in, in favor of the Sudanese um, military. Um, it has economic interests, but as I mentioned, it has strategic interests in relation to Sudan, securing its borders, also dealing with, of course, the many people that are coming in through the border, but also Egypt has a lot of economic interests also in Sudan. Um, the UAE I've already talked about. Um, you have Russia, which is also engaged in the conflict in Sudan through the Wagner Group. Uh, the Wagner Group is operating from the Central African Republic next door to Sudan on the west. And it's been a long time supporter of the RSF, particularly when it comes to weapons, surveillance, uh, sur surveillance equipment, and uh, also um, uh, drone, like drones and all sorts of uh, equipment. It has interests mainly in relation to economics. A lot of Sudan's gold has also gone to Russia and has subsidized the Ukraine war effort. The Ukraine campaign is being subsidized by Sudanese gold that is controlled mainly by the RSF. So 
Wagner, Russia is one element as well. Um, the EU, as I mentioned, looks to the region or particularly to Sudan in relation to its migration control agenda. So a lot of the focus there is about stabilizing the country so that you don't have a flood of uh, migrants crossing the, the coming, trying to come into Europe. And so a lot of its efforts have been in relation to mediation and, and things of that nature. Um, you also have the Gulf states. Their position has varied since 2019. Saudi was very much like the UAE. The RSF and the military were part of the Yemen campaign. They were part of the Saudi coalition. Saudi at the moment is more in a position of working with the US as a mediating space, even though historically it's, uh, and until very recently, has been a big supporter of the al-Bashir regime for economic and strategic reasons. The, the Red Sea, Sudan has a, it's almost the border that we have with um, um, the countries on the other side, Yemen and Saudi, and it's also land is a big thing. Um, historically, the Gulf, um, in the 1970s, Sudan was touted by the World Bank and a lot of the regional banks as the breadbasket of the Middle East because it has a lot of arable land. And so there was, it has been over the decades, a lot of uh, land investments of taking land for these big commercialized um, agricultural um, products. So that's one thing, but also the port, Turkey, uh, Russia, the US, they're interested in the Red Sea and having a position in Sudan on the Red Sea. There's more uh, other countries that are involved, but it, this is just some of them. Um, I also want to add something. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, when we talk about the geopolitics and the humanitarian situation, uh, we cannot neglect the political economy of the city as well. Um, and here I mean the uh, the hosting countries. Um, I was recently uh, in Cairo, and where I got to engage in conversations with uh, with Sudanese who fled the war to to Egypt, and. Um, people are refusing to be called as refugees. They refuse this label. Because the majority says that they paid a lot of money for the visa, they took an airplane, they entered the country legally, and nobody is giving, nobody is providing any kind of support. They only uh, rely on the, on the relatives in the diaspora. So um, in this meeting, they refuse to be called refugees. There's still so many topics about the feminist and revolutionary movements that we haven't spoken about, but I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Um, or maybe you can ask your question and then I will ask all of you three to have a final statement and then maybe you can also briefly consider the question. <laughs> uh, so thank you from my side uh, very much for the insightful and very dense um, speeches you gave. I have a very brief question. I hope I can formulate it clearly. Um, when we come up to Ratwas or Uta Rupert's idea of transnational feminist solidarity, and you are based in, in Bayreuth, I guess, and you in London, so what would you expect from intersectional, anti-racist, anti-colonial, decolonial? feminist communities here, like in particularly when you relate it to the feminist foreign policy that Germany is pursuing right now, there's also a strong emphasis on LGBTIQ rights, but also on economic cooperation. So I wonder what would you suggest or what want us to do or so how to support? Thanks. Yeah, actually this fits well also with my question for you for the wrapping up because I would like to like you to maybe say in your final statements also what can we take away you but also all of us who are here what can we take away from this discussion we had today on the feminist struggle in Sudan in Sudan for feminist uh, movements elsewhere. Thank you. Please Sama, you could start. Okay. Um, yes, um, I was planning actually to wrap up with the question of the transnational solidarity. Uh, I mean, as feminist movement in Sudan, we should be more open to the other experiences from the continent. I mean, if we look at the Liberian experience, uh, what should we learn from that? Women were organizing, women brought peace to Liberia, 
and I don't believe uh, the, the, the case of Sudan is way different. Um, anyhow, when talking about transnational solidarity here uh, in Germany, I believe we need more understanding for the sensitivity, the cultural sensitivity um, in Sudan. Cultural sensitivity when it comes to the um, feminists' agenda and discourse, when it comes to the queer subjects in Sudan. And instead of just uh, following pre-existed agenda of funders and uh, entities, um, I believe in the word of um, independency of the social movements. Um, uh, we have been thinking and, and putting some efforts uh, for um, having a diasporic uh, feminist forum uh, that focuses on discussions on how we can um, support the feminists on the ground. How can we as people in diaspora be the extension for these efforts? I think Sarah can elaborate more on this. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to continue? With yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think we, there are several layers to this question. Um, I think if I'm speaking, I'm actually in Berlin. Okay. And I'm not so okay, nor is it. I'm, 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 I don't have a lot of hope for this feminist foreign policy. Um, I don't because I see um, very deep contradictions to do with it and because it's embedded in the power structures that actually result in the situation that we're in. Um, I think that it, it is, a, um, what it does is it gives entry points and I think they're not being used right now in relation to Sudan. So I don't, in itself, I'm really, over my 20 years of activism, I've really moved from uh, this kind of politics of appealing to um, power to do something, simply because what power does is it creates a marketplace where it makes you compete. So it wants the Sudanese to compete with the Afghanis, with the Syrians, with the Egyptians, with uh, everybody. We have to break that logic because actually the one thing we didn't talk about is the fact that um, there is no solution in Sudan that is Sudanese in the sense that, of course, everything stems, the resistance stems from the ground. But there's a reason why so many of these movements of the last 20 years um, faced intense violence. And one of the reasons is because where we have not done very well is being able to connect our movements across borders in the region. Even within Sudan, we're talking about Sudanese women and girls, but it's of course not Sudanese women and girls only. Um, some of the women in the worst situations are refugee women from South Sudan, from Eritrea, from Ethiopia. We're in a situation in our region where there, it feels like there's nowhere left to run. You're running from Tigray to Sudan, and then the war starts in Sudan, and then you're running back. You're running from South Sudan. You're, as a Sudanese, you're running into Chad. You're running into Egypt. You're, the, some Syrians were living in Sudan. Like, it's a, it's a situation where, you know, capitalism has reached such a state, and the militarization of the state, the extractive machine is in such a state that it's creating crisis everywhere. And so our movements, which are powerful in different places, they have to get better at connecting. If I think of the German context specifically, the fact that Germany, France, Spain, and several other European countries are, you know, have a, declared themselves as having feminist foreign policies, and Germany last year, you know, um, the Auswärtige Gesamt released its uh, plan. Um, I think it's a neoliberal white feminism, and it's a neoliberal white feminism that is even more than that. It's very much embedded, of course, in the power structure. At the same time, I don't see radical feminists uh, holding that government accountable to what it, it actually does and what it's doing and holding it accountable to even the very modest things that it says it's committing to, right? And so I think there is a lot more space to do that. It doesn't have to be just on Sudan. I think actually it would be better if it's about, you know, the German foreign policy in the region as a whole and really connecting these struggles. 
So I think this is extremely important and we've been talking for four years, five years here to different audiences. We need to really, um, we don't need to appeal to the larger movement, but I think feminists have always been better at standing up for each other. And I think we need that. We need to see that and we need to see that pressure. I think there is where I see more hope here there is connections between Iranian feminist activists and queer activists and Sudanese ones and others. Uh, there is better, there's a lot of exile communities actually here that are having conversations out of the mainstream and trying to learn, especially learn from each other. And I think this is also very important. But the third way that I see is what Samah mentioned, which is there's another layer which is diasporic women themselves have a conversation to be had with women who are in Sudan and in the neighboring countries who are fighting these battles on the ground. And so we need support to be able to have these conversations because we have visa barriers, we have money barriers, we have communication barriers, we have massive amounts of barriers. And so we shouldn't have to sell again why this is important. It should be supported, so thank you. Thank you. My, my team, can I, can I still ask a final word for you to also maybe shortly speak about the lessons to be learned from the Sudanese context for feminist movements elsewhere? Um, I don't know like how to, how to wrap up. I think I need to point out something very important and not to be like, uh, um, you know, too, um, you know, too utopian, you know, I don't do like, you know, reflect the, like the resistance committees of the utopia. Um, um, you know, uh, see, we, 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 I see resistance committees as, you know, as, as, as um, you know, feminist um, spaces for organization because the nature of how the resistance committees, because they are, you know, grassroots and decentralized. And once you say decentralization, that automatically means feminism. It's allowing for these feminist structures to come in and, and um, you know, more women to, you know, be part, you know, of the of uh, of, of political decision. And, and 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 I know, like we spoke about, there was like this campaign for w more women to enter into the committees. But the fact that there, this campaign existed just proved that there is more localization that needs to be done within the resistance committees. There are still is kind of like even within this localization, there's like this kind of decentralizing of power, and 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 this this issue was brought up, you know, before the war, where women even within the resistance committees were feeling that they were being marginalized, they were be being assigned to like certain roles, even the ro role of spokesperson. There was like some kind of yeah, there's agency, of course. You know, these women like worked hard for this position. There's also this kind of tokenism. They're like, look at us, we're different. We have women who speak on our behalf of the resistance committees. But but there was a lot. I like I used to hear a lot of complaints of women being, you know, voices being, um, you know, not giving uh, 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 like uh, the weight that they deserve. Um, but on the other side, you know, the uh, the uh, feminist movements and the struggle of feminists feminists within the resistance committees were able to bring, you know, very important topics that used to be marginalized to, um, you know, to the forefront. I mean, from the beginning of the war, the first, uh, you know, when we are, people are trying to provide like aid, one of the most important items was, you know, sanitary, you know, products, which was something that used to be laughable before, but now it's like central. And also addressing um, you know, um, um, you know, domestic violence and family violence, which has been exasperated within the war. You know, we've seen a lot of women escaping, uh, you know, the violence of their families in the war as they are, you know, escaping or fleeing the war. They're escaping, you know, the violence of their fathers and brothers and, and finding, uh, and, and women coordinating to find, you know, safe spaces for them. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, so there, there is like optimism, but also there is a pessimism because uh, war shrinks the spa public space and, and, and opportunities for public organization. And I can see right now, like, women contributions are, like, a bit fading into the background, even within the resistance committees, because of the nature of war, because of the danger war, uh, uh, um, you know, imposes on, on women specifically. Um, I just want to put, like, so what, what can we learn? Uh, what we can we learn is that um, 
You know, what's happening in Sudan is going to happen everywhere. The disintegration of the state, that's happening everywhere. You know, even in the global north. We can see it when you say, like, if you feel this exasperation, like, how come everybody is against, you know, calling for a ceasefire? You know, we see, like, movements, like, probably in Germany, you know, calling for a ceasefire. But how are political speaking this different language? Why is there this, this wide gap? Why isn't representative democracy not representing anymore? Well, that's because this is, we are going through this like late stages of, uh, of the state being disabled. It, it happened quicker in Sudan because the state wasn't as strong. Uh, you, you have stronger institutions. I, I want to use the words of the activist, uh, uh, Egyptian activist who's in prison, Al Abdel Fattah, when he addressed you know, the global north uh, after the Arab Spring. You have not yet been defeated. Uh, but I think <laughs> um, that you can still, you know, uh, you know, urge your democracies to not support, uh, you know, dictatorships and you know, militias in the global south. But I, I even see that there, this defeat is happening even where I live. You know, even in the global north, like institutions, institutions are starting to integrate and starting to represent the, uh, you know, the interests of a privileged few. And so what you could learn is, you know, the localization and, you know, grassroots organization and creating this kind of, you know, public sovereignty and, you know, addressing the urgent needs. I think this is what we've learned in the, in the revolution, like, you know, addressing the daily needs, you know, the daily interests. These are not marginalized or things that can wait. Oh, you, you know, um, you can't handle stress at work. That's not a marginalized thing that has to wait. And we have to address, you know, the grand themes first. I think like localized, um, um, you know, politics um, and, and grassroots organization. I don't need to say feminism, you know, like when I see say these things, these are feminism. There is no feminism that exists, you know, in, in you know, political structures that have, you know, hierarchy and accumulation of power and privilege in them. You know, feminism can only exist within like, um, uh, you know, sovereign um, 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 grassroots, um, you know, organizing. And I think this is what we need to learn. This is how we need to view, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the, the formation of grassroots organizing in Sudan, because it's not complete, it's not perfect. And, um, uh, you know, copy it and, 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 and learn from it even here. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I want to end with. And thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much for being here today and sharing your knowledge. My son Eli Jumi, Samar Khadafallah, and Sarah Abbas. Thank you also for your attention and your patience, although it started a bit later and we're finishing a bit late. But I hope you could take something out of it. And I don't know if you, Radwa, you still say some final words or you just go home. <laughs> <laughs> It's the last one in the series, right? So now you can sleep. <laughs> exactly. I do want to know. But um, no, thank you very, very much for this um, very insightful and um, outlook, actually, uh, through the series. Um, thank you for your questions and thank you very much for your final words. And for the technical support, I mean, it was so smooth. Thank you. I'm so used to so many disasters. <laughs> That's true.